Hi guys! All right, so today it's chapters five and six of The Witches. I know it's a little late. I had a lot of stuff to do today, but I saw all the emails you sent me. So let's just go ahead and get right into this. So we're going to start with chapter five. Summer Holidays. The Easter holidays came and went, and the summer term began at school. My grandmother and I had already planned to take our summer holiday in Norway, and we talked about almost nothing else every evening. She had booked a cabin for each of us on the boat from Newcastle to Oslo at the earliest possible moment after my school broke up. And from Oslo, she was going to take me to a place she knew down on the south coast near Arendal, where she'd spent her own summer holidays as a child nearly 80 years ago. All day long, she said, my brother and I were out in the rowing boat. The whole coast is dotted with tiny islands and there's nobody on them. We used to explore them and dive into the sea off of the lovely smooth granite rocks. And sometimes on the way out, we would drop the anchor and fish for cod and whiting. And if we caught anything, we would build a fire on an island and fry the fish in a pan for our lunch. There is no finer fish in the world than absolutely fresh cod. What did you use for bait, Grandmama, when you went fishing? Mussels, she said. Everyone uses mussels for bait in Norway. And if we didn't catch any fish, we would boil the mussels in a saucepan and eat those. Were they good? Delicious, she said. Cook them in the seawater until they are tender and salty. What else did you do, Grandmama? We used to row out and wave to the shrimp boats on their way home, and they would stop and give us a handful of shrimps each. The shrimps were still warm from having been just cooked, and we would sit in the rowing boat, peeling them and gobbling them up. The head was the best part. The head, I said. You squeeze the head between your teeth and you suck out the insides. It's marvelous. You and I will do all of those things this summer, my darling, she said. Grandmama, I said, I can't wait. I simply can't wait to go. Nor can I, she said. When there were only three weeks of the summer term left, an awful thing happened. My grandmother got pneumonia. She became very ill, and a trained nurse moved into the house to look after her. The doctor explained to me that pneumonia is not normally a dangerous illness nowadays because of penicillin. Penicillin is a medication. But when a person is more than 80 years old, as my grandmother was, then it is very dangerous indeed. He said he didn't even dare to move her to the hospital in her condition. So she stayed in her bedroom and I hung out outside of the door while oxygen cylinders and all sorts of other frightening things were taken into her. Can I go in and see her? I asked. No, dear, the nurse said, not at the moment. A fat and jolly lady called Mrs. Spring who used to come and clean our house every day, also moved in and slept in the house. Mrs. Spring looked after me and cooked my meals. I liked her very much, but she wasn't a patch on my grandmother for telling stories. One evening, about 10 days later, the doctor came downstairs and said to me, you can go in and see her now, but only for a short time, she's been asking for you. I flew up the stairs and burst into my grandmother's room and threw myself into her arms. Hey there, the nurse said, be careful with her. Will you be all right now, Grandmama? I asked. The worst is over, she said. I'll soon meet up again. Will she? I said to the nurse. Oh, yes the nurse answered smiling. She told us she simply had to get better because she had to look after you. I gave her another cigar. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I gave her another hug. 
They won't let me have a cigar, she said. But you wait till they're gone. She's a tough old bird, the nurse said. We'll have her up in another week. The nurse was right. Within a week, my grandmother was thumping around the house with her gold-topped cane and interfering with Mrs. Spring's cooking. I thank you for all of your help, Mrs. Spring, she said. But you can go home now. Oh, no, I can't, Mrs. Spring said. The doctor told me to see that you take it very easy for the next few days. The doctor said more than that. He dropped a bombshell on my grandmother and me by telling us that on no account were we to risk the journey to Norway this summer. Rubbish, my grandmother cried. I promised him we'll go. It's too far, the doctor said. It would be very dangerous. But I'll tell you what you can do. You can take your grandson to a nice hotel on the south coast of England instead. The sea air is just what you need. Oh no, I said. Do you want your grandmother to die? The doctor asked me. Never, I said. Then don't let her go on a long journey this summer. She's not yet strong enough. And stop her smoking of those vile black cigars. In the end, the doctor had his way about the holiday, but not about the cigars. Rooms were booked for us in a place called the Hotel Magnificent in the famous seaside town of Bournemouth. Bournemouth, my grandmother told me, was full of old people like herself. They retired there by the thousands because the air was so bracing and healthy, it, it <clears throat> was so bracing and healthy that it kept them so they believed, alive for a few extra years. Does it? I asked. Of course not, she said. It's all Tommy rot. But just for once, I think we've got to obey the doctor. Soon after that, my grandmother and I took the train to Bournemouth and settled into the Hotel Magnificent. It was an enormous white building on the seafront, and it looked to me like a pretty boring place to spend a summer holiday in. I had my own separate bedroom, but there was a door connecting my room with my grandmother's room so that we could visit each other without going into the corridor. There's a little gnat flying around. He also wants to read the book. Just before we left for Bournemouth, my grandmother had given me, as consolation, a present of two white mice in a little cage, and of course I took them with me. They were terrific fun, those mice. I called them William and Mary, and in the hotel I set out right away, teaching them to do tricks. The first trick I taught them was to creep up the sleeve of my jacket and come out by my neck. Then I taught them to climb up to the back of my neck, <clears throat> onto the top of my head, I did this by putting cake crumbs in my hair. On the very first morning after our arrival, the chambermaid was making my bed when one of my mice poked its head out from under the sheets. The maid let out a shriek that brought a dozen people running to see who had been murdered. I was reported to the manager. There was an unpleasant scene in the manager's office with the manager, my grandmother, and me. The manager whose name was Mr. Stringer, was a bristly man in a tall black coat. I cannot permit mice in my hotel, madam, he said to my grandmother. How dare you say that when your rotten hotel is full of rats anyway, my grandmother cried. Rats, cried Mr. Stringer, going mauve in the face. There are no rats in this hotel. I saw one this very morning, my grandmother said. It was running down the corridor into the kitchen. That is not true, cried Mr. Stringer. Okay, so there's pictures there. And then there's, there's that one. You had better get the rat catcher in at once, my grandmother said, before I report you to the public health authorities. I expect there's rats scuttling all over the kitchen floor and stealing food off the shelves and jumping in and out of the soup. Never, cried Mr. Stringer. 
No wonder my breakfast toast was all nibbled round the edges this morning. My grandmother went on relentlessly. No wonder it had a nasty, ratty taste. If you're not careful, the health people will be ordering the entire hotel to be closed before everyone gets typhoid fever. You are not being serious, madam, Mr. Stringer said. I was never more serious in my life, my grandmother said. Are you or are you not going to allow my grandson to keep his white mice in his room? The manager knew when he had been beaten. May I suggest a compromise, madam, he said. I will permit them to keep them in his room as long as they are never allowed out of the cage. How's that? That will suit us very well, my grandmother said, and she stood up and marched out of the room with me behind her. There's no way you can train mice inside a cage. Yet I dared not let them out because the chambermaid was spying on me all the time. She had a key to my door and she kept bursting in at all hours, trying to catch me with the mice out on the cage. She told me that the first mouse to break the rules would be drowned in a bucket of water by the hall porter. I decided to seek a safer place where I could carry on with the training. There must surely be an empty room in this enormous hotel. I put one mouse into each trouser pocket and wandered downstairs in search of a secret spot. The ground floor of the hotel was a maze of public rooms, all of them named in gold letters on the doors. I wandered through the lounge and the smoking room and the card room and the reading room and the drawing room. None of them were empty. I went down a long wide corridor and at the end of it, I came to the ballroom. There were double doors leading into it, and in front of the doors, there was a large notice board on a stand. The notice on the board said, RSPCC meeting, strictly private. This room is reserved for the annual meeting of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. The double doors into the room were open. I peeped in. It was a colossal room. There were rows and rows of chairs, all facing a platform. The chairs were painted gold and they had little red cushions on the seats. There was not a soul in sight. I idled cautiously into the room. What a lovely, secret, silent place it was. The meeting of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children must have taken place earlier in the day and now they had all gone home. And even if they hadn't, even if they did suddenly come pouring in, they would be wonderful, kind people who would look with favor upon a young mouse trainer going about his business. At the back of the room, there was a large folding screen with Chinese dragons painted on it. I decided, just to be on the safe side, to go behind this screen and do my training there. I wasn't a bit frightened of the prevention of cruelty to children people, but there was always a chance that Mr. Stringer, the manager, might pop his head round the door. If he did and he saw the mice, the poor things would be in the hall porter's bucket of water before I could shout stop. I tiptoed back to the room and settled myself on the thick green carpet behind the big screen. What a splendid place this was! ideal for mouse training. I took William and Mary out of my trouser pockets. They sat beside me on the carpet, quiet and well behaved. The trick that I was going to teach them was tightrope walking. It is not all that difficult to train an intelligent mouse to be an expert tightrope walker, provided that you know exactly how to go about it. First, you have to get a piece of string. I have that. And then, you must have some good cake. So there's a picture of him going into the ballroom. A fine currant cake is the favorite food of white mice. They are dotty about it. I had brought with me a rock cake, which I had pocketed while having tea with my grandmama the day before. 
Now here's what you do. You stretch the string tight between your two hands, but you start by keeping it very short, only about three inches. You put the mouse on your right hand and a little piece of cake in your left hand. The mouse is therefore only three inches away from the cake. He can see it and he can smell it. His whiskers twitch with excitement. He can almost reach the cake by leaning forward, but not quite. He only has to take two steps along the string to reach this tasty morsel. He ventures forward, one paw on the string, then the other. If the mouse has a good sense of balance, and most of them do, he'll get across easily. I started with William. He walked the string without a moment's hesitation. I let him have a quick nibble of the cake just to whet his appetite. Then I put him back in my right hand. This time, I lengthened the string. I made it about six inches long. William knew what to do now. With superb balance, he walked step by step along the string until he reached the cake. He was rewarded with another nibble. Quite soon, William was walking a 24 inch tightrope, or rather tight string, from one hand to the other to reach the cake. It was wonderful to watch him. He was enjoying himself tremendously. I was careful to hold the string near the carpet so that if he did lose his balance, he wouldn't have to far, he wouldn't have far to fall, but he never fell. William was obviously a natural acrobat and a great type rope walking mouse. <clears throat> All right, now it was Mary's turn. I put William on the carpet beside me and rewarded him with some extra crumbs, crumbs and a current. Then I started going through the same routine all over again with Mary. My blinding ambition, you see, my dream of dreams, was to become one day the owner of a white mouse circus. I would have a small stage with red curtains in front of it. And when the curtains were drawn apart, the audience would see my world famous performing mice walking on tight ropes, swinging from trapeze, turning somersaults in the air, bouncing on trampolines, and all the rest of it. I would have white mice riding on white rats and the rats would gallop furiously round and round the stage. I was beginning to picture myself traveling first class all over the globe with my famous white mouse circus and performing for all the crowned heads of Europe. I was about halfway through Mary's training when suddenly I heard voices outside the ballroom door. The sound grew louder. It swelled into a great babble of speech from many throats. I recognized the voice of the awful hotel manager, Mr. Stringer. Help, I thought, but thank heavens for the huge scream. I crouched behind it and peered through the crack between two of the folding sections. I could see the entire length and width of the ballroom without anyone seeing me. Well, ladies, I am sure you will be quite comfortable in here, Mr. Stringer's voice was saying. Then, in through the double doors he marched, black tailcoat and all, spreading his arms wide as he ushered in a great flock of ladies. If there is anything we can do for you, do not hesitate to let me know, he went on. Tea will be served for all of you on the sunshine terrace after you have concluded your meeting. With that, he bowed and scraped himself out of the room as a vast herd of ladies from the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children came streaming in. They wore pretty clothes and all of them had hats on their heads. All right. We're gonna do one more chapter. We're gonna do chapter six, the meeting. Now that the manager had gone, I was not particularly alarmed. What better than to be imprisoned in a room full of these splendid ladies? If I ever got to talking to them, I might even suggest that they come and do a bit of cruelty to children prevention at my school. We could certainly use it there. 
In they came, talking their heads off. They began milling round and choosing their seats, and there was a whole lot of stuff like, Come and sit next to me, Millie dear, and, Oh, hello, Patrice, I haven't seen you since the last meeting. What an adorable dress you have on. I decided to stay where I was and let them get on with their meeting while I got on with my mouse training. But I watched them for a while longer through the crack in the screen, waiting for them to settle down. How many were there? I guessed about 200. The back rows filled up first. They all seemed to want to sit as far back from the platform as possible. There was a lady wearing a tiny green hat in the middle of the back row who kept scratching the nape of her neck. She couldn't leave it alone. It fascinated me, the way her fingers kept scratching away at her hair on the back of her neck. Had she known somebody was watching her from behind, I'm sure she would have been embarrassed. I wondered if she had dandruff. All of a sudden, I noticed that the lady next to her was doing the same thing. And the next one, and the next. The whole lot of them were doing it. They were all scratching away like mad at the hair on the backs of their necks. Did they have fleas in their hair? More likely it was nits. A boy at school called Ashton had had nits in his hair last term and the matron made him dip his whole head in turpentine. It killed the nits all right, but nearly killed Ashton as well. Half the skin came away from his scalp. I began to be fascinated by these hair scratching ladies. It's always funny when you catch someone doing something coarse and she thinks no one is looking. Nose picking, for example, or scratching her bottom. Hair scratching is very nearly as unattractive, especially if it goes on and on. I decided it had to be nits. Then the most astonishing thing happened. I saw one lady pushing her fingers up underneath the hair on her head and the hair, the entire head of hair lifted upwards all in one piece and the hand slid underneath the hair and went on scratching. She was wearing a wig. She was also wearing gloves. I glanced swiftly around at the rest of the now seated audience. Every one of them was wearing gloves. My blood turned to ice. I began to shake all over. I glanced, I glanced frantically behind me for a back door to escape though, but there wasn't one. Should I leap out from behind the screen and make a dash to the double doors? But those double doors were already closed and I could see a woman standing in front of them. She was bending forward and fixing some sort of a metal chain around the two door handles. Keep still, I told myself. No one has seen you yet. There's no reason in the world why they should come and look behind the screen. But one false move, one cough, one sneeze, one nose blow, one little sound of any sort, and it won't just be one witch that gets me, it'll be 200. At that point, I think I fainted. The whole thing was altogether too much for a small boy to cope with. But I don't believe I was out for more than a few seconds. And when I came to, I was lying on the carpet and I was still, thank heavens, behind the screen. There was absolute silence all around me. Rather shakily, I got to my knees and peered once again through the crack in the screen. Okay. There we go. And that is where we are going to stop today. Tomorrow we will read chapters 7 and 8. So, don't forget to leave a comment down on our Google Classroom. Tell me how you guys are liking this story. And don't forget to keep doing your work. If you have any questions, make sure to email me. Don't forget, stay inside, stay healthy, remember to wash your hands, and that I love you and I hope to see you all soon. Bye.